What is up you guys? Welcome back to the channel and welcome to another gruesome get ready with me video. If this is your first time seeing my face, my name is Jessica and every week I sit down here and I talk about a true crime case whilst I put on some makeup because why not combine two things that have absolutely no business being combined? Just kidding. Obviously, I love this combination and hopefully you will too. Maybe even enough to consider subscribing to the channel. But with that said, I know that there are some people who are deeply enraged by this genre of content. So if you find yourself swelling with anger at the thought of a true crime and makeup video, fear not because just for you, I've made sure to list some other creators and resources down in the description box who've covered today's story in a way that I assume you'll enjoy more. See, I'm like super nice. You should give me a chance. <laughs> Anyways, with all of that said and done, let's go ahead and get into today's case. Okay, so you guys remember when I was like... Oh, I'm gonna take a week off. I'm gonna load up on research. Well, I did do that, uh, but then last minute, I came across this story and it captivated me, bitch. It was all I thought about for like three days straight. So much so that instead of using any of the cases that I spent the week gathering research on as the topic of today's video, I instead spent the last like 36 straight hours mapping out, filming, and editing this video to get it up for you today. And that, my friends, is quite a trippy concept if you consider the fact that right now in this moment, I haven't actually finished filming, editing, or uploading this video. But by the time you guys see me saying this, I obviously will have done all of those things. What? What's wrong with me? Actually, you know what? It's probably best to not Pull at that thread. Anyways, today we are talking about the absolutely mystifying disappearance of 23-year-old Phoenix Colden. Quick disclaimer, this case is unsolved and I don't love covering cases that don't have a concrete resolution to them, mainly because this shit will keep me up at night. But like I said, I have not been able to shake this case since I came across it. And I just think that Phoenix's story is so important because not only is she missing and potentially in danger out there somewhere, but it also sheds a light on a lot of societal imbalances that desperately need to be rectified. Yeah, a lot of important conversation topics are going to come up within this story. So what do you say I stop prevaricating and just start at the beginning? All right, so Phoenix Lucille Reeves was born in California on May 23rd, 1988. She was born to her mother, Goldia, who for the first little bit of Phoenix's life raised her in California as a single mother. However, when Phoenix was still fairly young, Goldia married a computer systems engineer named Lawrence Colden. And shortly after, the new blended family of three packed up and relocated from California to Missouri so that Lawrence could pursue his career. They settled into the quiet, peaceful Spanish Lake community in the mid 90s with their home specifically sitting on Country Brook Drive. Now, despite the fact that Phoenix was not biologically related to Lawrence, he still loved, viewed, and treated her as if she were his very own daughter. And speaking as someone whose husband took on my firstborn as his very own, I know exactly how much this likely meant. To Goldia. To see her daughter and her new husband's father-daughter relationship thrive and blossom had to have brought her so much joy. Lawrence even eventually ended up adopting Phoenix and he and Goldia changed her last name to match theirs. So they were officially the Coldens, party of three. And that's all most anyone ever knew them as, including Phoenix. Yeah, because she was so young when Lawrence and her mother got married, she never really consciously knew a time without him in her life. And because of that, Goldia and Lawrence decided not to ever really clue her in to the fact that there ever was a time without him. And while I am fully of the belief that DNA exclusively does not make you a parent, rather that a parent child relationship is determined by love, trust, respect, and the dedication of time, among other things. All things that Lawrence willingly devoted to Phoenix all throughout her upbringing. However, 
That said, I do struggle with the thought of keeping a secret like this from your child. I'm going to try to tread incredibly lightly here because I certainly don't want what I'm saying to come off as judgy or anything like that. I obviously wasn't in Goldia's shoes. I could not possibly know what factors went into her making the decision that she did. But from an outside perspective, I personally worry about the repercussions that could come from a child finding out about something like this under the wrong circumstances, you know? I don't know, it just seems to me like it would be way more damaging to a child's mental health for them to discover or find something like that out on their own. How could they not feel incredibly betrayed by something like that? Like their parents had either lied to or misled them for their whole life. And I did a little bit of research on the topic and I think that statistically speaking as well, outcomes are generally more positive in situations like this when the parents carefully curate these discussions. When they sit down and they talk openly and honestly to their child and explain the situation to them from as young of an age as possible. Doesn't that just seem like it's much more likely to promote a healthy view of the family dynamic? Whereas hiding it might make it seem shameful or like it's wrong. I am certainly of that opinion, but Goldia is a very religious woman and she had every intention of raising her daughter with very strong Christian morals and values, i.e. no sex before marriage, which admittedly, would be hard to preach to your child and enforce if they knew that their very existence proved that you yourself had not always lived by that same standard. So I guess that did put Goldia in between a rock and a hard place, so to speak, which ultimately led her to make the decision she did regarding the identity of Phoenix's biological father. A decision I'm sure that she felt more than confident in in the moment. I'm sure that she thought she was making the right choice. And for years, Phoenix seemed like she was an incredibly well-adjusted little girl. She was friendly and well-liked at church and school. She was sweet and well-mannered. She was very intelligent. And despite being soft-spoken, Phoenix was really, really funny. And she had just an incredible sense of humor. No matter who you hear speak about her, one thing always comes across, and that is that Phoenix was gifted, more or less in everything she picked up. Whether it was school, music, or sports, Phoenix excelled. And Goldia and Lawrence were always there behind her every step of the way, making sure that she had as many opportunities as possible open to her. She played guitar, piano, and violin, and she played in the handbell choir at her church. She played basketball, she was a competitive fencing champion, and on top of all of this, Phoenix also gave her all academically in hopes of someday becoming a doctor. <laughs> Personally, I don't have this kind of dedication or motivation for myself, even as an adult. So to hear that this kind of drive and tenacity was coming from a child, low-key makes me feel a little bad about myself. But I'll just keep blaming it on the fact that my ADHD didn't get diagnosed until I was almost 30, and now I'm just stuck in my neurodivergent ways. Anyways, um, Phoenix was undoubtedly headed towards a very bright future. However, just before she was due to start middle school, everything in her life kind of got flipped on its head. As I mentioned, Phoenix was really well liked at her school and she had a ton of friends. So it was very surprising and honestly upsetting to her when she learned that Come the fall, when she was going to be starting sixth grade, Phoenix would no longer be attending public school and would instead be staying home to be homeschooled by Goldia. Up to this point, Goldia had been working as a social worker. However, in the early 2000s, as Phoenix cruised towards her preteen and teen years, her mother really started to worry about outside influences corrupting her daughter. In other words, she worried, as I'm sure most parents do, that Phoenix, if not kept close, may come across and fall in with the wrong crowd. To an extent, I fully understand this worry. Like I said, I'm sure that most parents worry about this at one point or another, but I think that in this particular instance, it goes further than that. As previously mentioned, Goldia had very strong opinions on how a Christian young lady should carry herself. Don't cross your legs one over the other, set up straight, smile, don't be loud, don't be vulgar, be neat, 
carry yourself discreetly and femininely. Good God, she would just loathe me. <laughs> but Phoenix seemed just as dedicated to this lifestyle as she was. But even so, I guess Goldia truly felt that the best way to make sure it stayed that way was to keep as close an eye on her daughter as possible. So she did just that. Even though Phoenix desperately wanted to remain in public school. Which, to clarify, when I say public school, I don't mean in the traditional sense of like public versus private schools in this scenario specifically. I just mean it as like a traditional school environment outside of the home. So I guess I should be saying traditional school because I think she did attend some private schools here and there. But yeah, she just wanted the traditional school experience. She wanted to grow up closely with her friends. She wanted to go to football games and socialize. She wanted to go to prom. She wanted to walk the stage at graduation. She just wanted to experience the things she saw her peers experiencing. But despite her wishes from sixth grade on, Phoenix was sheltered at home and schooled by Goldia. She completed her homeschooling and received her high school diploma in 2007 with plans to attend the University of Missouri at St. Louis for her post-secondary education. And when it came time for her to start college, Phoenix actually moved into her own apartment, which surprisingly, Goldia and Lawrence leased and paid for for her. And this was the First real taste of independence it seems like Phoenix really ever had from her parents, which arguably is later than most people experience some level of independence from their parents. Because whether it's extracurriculars or an after-school job or just being allowed to go out with your friends, I feel like most teens gradually venture outside the nest more and more over the years as they inch closer to adulthood, legal independence, and living on their own. And in my opinion, that's how it should be. That way kids can learn life lessons little by little. Whereas I think kids who are so heavily sheltered tend to find themselves in precarious situations that they don't know how to handle due to their lack of life experiences. Now, I'm obviously not saying let your kids go out and go fucking bananas with no rules or expectations. I'm just saying that if you shelter your child from everything, how are they ever supposed to know how to navigate or identify a dangerous situation? I wholeheartedly understand the sentiment of wanting to protect your child from anything and everything, but more often than not, I feel like trying to do so actually ends up having the opposite effect on them. Did that make sense? I hope so, but uh, probably not. Eh, what are you gonna do? Now, even though Phoenix was finally out from underneath her parents' thumb, she still stayed in pretty close contact with them, and she still made a point to visit them and continue going to church with them on Sundays. And things carried on like this for the next few years. It wasn't until May of 2011 that things, once again, kind of fell apart for Phoenix. Because it was around this time that Goldia decided that given the fact that Phoenix's school was only a short drive from their house on Country Brook Drive, it didn't really make sense for she and Lawrence to foot the bill for Phoenix's apartment. It just wasn't something that was working out financially for them anymore. And viewing it as an unnecessary expense, they insisted that Phoenix move back home so that they could terminate the lease on her apartment. And just like that, after four years of living on her own and experiencing the independence she'd craved for so many years, Phoenix was back home and back under Goldia's watchful eye. She went from feeling like an adult and doing her own thing to once again feeling like a child and having to live at the mercy of her mother's very, very strong and very specific opinions. Phoenix is in her 20s at this point, mind you, but when she was back living at home, Goldia was determined to not only enact a strict curfew, but also to attempt to act as an authority on who Phoenix could and could not spend time with. She didn't even want Phoenix to walk down the street a few houses to spend time with her friend Akira because she was convinced that Akira was a bad influence on Phoenix. Goldia's even gone on record almost criticizing Phoenix for who she was choosing to spend her time with, saying that Phoenix was trying to fit in with people who looked like her instead of people who were on her level. She said that she'd taught Phoenix to always be nice to everyone, but that the people in her inner circle should be either on or above 
her level. Understandably, having the independent life she was building basically ripped out from under her and being forced to move back in with her parents didn't really sit all that well with Phoenix. She was an adult. She didn't need her parents controlling what she did. And even though as a child, she'd been very passive and very unlikely to ever voice an opinion that conflicted with her parents. In this young adult season of her life, Phoenix was significantly more outspoken. After moving back in with them, it seemed like Phoenix and her parents grappled, if you will, about damn near everything. They may have all been living under the same roof again, but the distance between them had never been greater. Goldia and Lawrence's once obedient, golden child was now rebelling and withdrawing from them. She wasn't as bubbly or talkative with them as she once was. Instead, she was sitting further and further away from her mom at each and every church service. And evidently, she would frequently spend hours just sitting in her car in the driveway, talking on the phone with her friends. And I have seen a lot of people say that this was weird, but I've done this before. Sometimes sitting in the car is just more quiet and more private. Even if you're not necessarily talking about anything secretive, sometimes you just want to be able to concentrate and give your entire mental bandwidth to the conversation, which can be hard to do if you're surrounded by other people. Am I wrong? Is it weird? Am I dumb for thinking it's not? I don't know. From what I could tell, Goldie and Lawrence did think it was weird, but to the best of my knowledge, they didn't press the matter because... They figured basically exactly what I just said, that she was trying to maintain some level of privacy since she'd lost most of it when she'd been forced to move back home. And all of this, everything we've discussed so far, brings us to Sunday, December 18th, 2011. It started out like the majority of Sundays did in the Colden household. Phoenix and Goldia woke up, ate breakfast, got ready, and headed to church around 11 a.m. They rode to church together in Phoenix's black 1998 Chevy Trailblazer, not only because carpooling to and from the same place obviously just makes the most sense, but also because Goldia's car was currently in the shop getting some work done. So they did arrive to church together. However, very shortly thereafter, they ended up parting ways. Phoenix met up with her fellow handbell choir members and they played the service. And when that was done, Goldia went to the weekly fellowship gathering while Phoenix waited for her in the car. Then on the way home, seemingly out of nowhere, Phoenix began kind of pouring her heart out to Goldia, telling her that she wanted things to go back to how they used to be and that she didn't want to fight about everything anymore. And understandably, this really struck a chord with Goldia. Things had been pretty contentious since Phoenix had moved back home. So hearing that her daughter wanted to smooth things over and get their relationship back on track, well, Goldia couldn't help but feel incredibly thankful. She prayed, every day for Phoenix. So I have to imagine that it felt pretty good to see some return on that investment, if you will. From there, I think they made a quick pit stop at a store before they finally made it home. And I've seen different versions reported as to how the afternoon played out once Phoenix and Goldia did get home from church. So I'm going to relay to you what happened to the best of my understanding. As always, I'm just a lady with a camera and access to the internet. And while I always try my best to research things thoroughly and deliver the most accurate information possible, I am just one person in a sea of available information on the internet. So if my retelling of this sounds slightly different than other retellings you've heard, that's why. I'm simply trying to piece together multiple different versions that I've heard of the same story. So to the best of my understanding, once Phoenix and Goldia got home from church, Phoenix spent some time outside playing basketball before she then retreated to her car to take a phone call, which like we discussed was fairly typical. What was not typical though, was that sometime just before 3 p.m., Lawrence happened to notice Phoenix backing out of the driveway. And this was weird because Phoenix wouldn't typically leave the house without at least telling her parents where she was going. Even if she was just running a quick errand, which Lawrence assumed was the case that day, normally she'd still pop in before she left and let them know like, hey, I'm running down the street, I'll be right back. But this time she didn't do that. So they didn't really know what to expect as far as what time she might be back. They assumed it wouldn't be long, but obviously they really had no way to know for sure. However, it wasn't until that evening when Phoenix still hadn't returned home 
that Goldia started to voice to Lawrence that she was getting kind of concerned. Lawrence tried to reassure her that everything was likely fine, that Phoenix was an adult, and just because she was out longer than they'd expected didn't mean that anything was wrong. It didn't mean that she was in trouble. However, as midnight rolled around, after hours of trying to get a hold of Phoenix, Goldia was beside herself. Phoenix simply would not stay out that late without at least telling them where she was. Sure, she was an adult, but she would never intentionally worry her parents like this. The only thing they were left kind of holding on to, other than prayer, was the fact that Phoenix's 1am curfew was fast approaching. A curfew that she had never broken by more than a half an hour. So surely she would be walking through the door with an explanation any second, right? Well, sadly, no. And after what felt like the longest night of their lives, as morning broke, Goldia and Lawrence began feverishly calling anyone and everyone they could think of to ask if they knew where Phoenix was. Unfortunately though, no one had anything helpful to tell the Coldens. And that was the last straw for Goldia. Clearly something was wrong and she was not about to sit around and waste any more valuable time. She and Lawrence contacted the police early that afternoon and attempted to report their daughter missing. However, as soon as the officer they were speaking to got to Phoenix's birth date, he paused. She was born in 1988 and it was 2011. She was 23 years old and she had not even been missing for 24 hours. So I'm sure you can all tell exactly where this is going. Goldia and Lawrence were told that Phoenix was an adult and that she was well within her rights to leave the house without telling her parents where she was going or when she intended on being back. She could stay out for as long as she wanted without checking in with them because she was a grown woman. The statement that Goldia was absolutely not having. She told the officer that she didn't know what wolves raised him, but that was not how they did things in their family. And while obviously nothing that we're talking about here today is funny, even in the least, that made me chuckle. Goldia, don't play. She'll tell you what's up and she's gonna make you feel dumb as hell while she does it. So likely feeling more than just a little red in the face, the officer retreated to his cruiser briefly in order to run the license plate number for Phoenix's blazer. But frustratingly, this too came back with nothing. And I say that this is frustrating because in actuality, Phoenix's car had been discovered and impounded the previous day, the day she went missing. In fact, it had been found less than three hours after she'd left home. It had been found abandoned on the corner of 9th Street and St. Clair Avenue in East St. Louis, Illinois, just before 5.30. And even though it was just a 25 minute drive away from the Colden's home, it was technically in another state. But rather than contact Goldia, who was the registered owner of the car, it was simply towed away to an impound lot and labeled as abandoned. So I don't know if this didn't populate when the officer searched the plates because it was technically in a different state or if there was, I don't know, I guess like a delay period between when vehicles get impounded and when they appear on like a comprehensive database. I'm not sure. All I know is that the Coldens didn't find out anything about where Phoenix's vehicle was or where and how it had been found until weeks later. Yes, you heard me correctly. I said weeks. Meanwhile, family, friends, and church acquaintances of Phoenix's took it upon themselves to hit the streets and begin searching for her. However, despite their best efforts, they continued to come up empty handed day after day. I think deep down everyone was kind of holding out hope that Phoenix would somehow miraculously show back up at home for Christmas. Obviously, we know the Coldens were incredibly devoted to their faith, so Christmas has always been a really important holiday to them. So when it passed with no word from Phoenix, the gravity of the situation really started to set in for everyone. How does a young, vibrant girl with so much going for her and such a bright future just vanish? I cannot even begin to imagine how difficult it must have been to accept that. It makes me sick to my stomach to think about what Goldia and Lawrence must have been and still continue to go through, but let me not get ahead of myself. So Christmas comes and goes, no sign or word from Phoenix. The ball drops in Times Square, 
calendar resets and Goldie and Lawrence bring in 2012 still reeling from the disappearance of their little girl. They still had virtually no information regarding what may have happened, mind you, and it wasn't until a few days into the new year that they would finally get any information regarding what had happened the day she went missing. Because that is when a friend of the Coldens reached out to them to let them know that they had just happened across Phoenix's car, sitting in an impound lot in East St. Louis. Yeah, it wasn't even the police that found the car or told the Coldens where it was. It was a friend of the family who'd stumbled across it purely by happenstance and then told them about it. Suffice it to say that um, someone had dropped the ball pretty hard, but <laughs> trust and believe I'm going to go all the way off about the investigation later. So just put a pin in that for me right now. Anyways, so yeah, now they know where the car is, which is good, but even though it was a step in the right direction, it certainly didn't make Lawrence and Goldia feel any better about the situation. Because while I previously mentioned that the car had been found in the middle of the road at the intersection of 9th Street and St. Clair Avenue in East St. Louis, Illinois, I have yet to explain to you that the area that Phoenix's car was found was actually an incredibly dangerous area. The crime rate in East St. Louis is significantly higher than the national American average. And for a long time, it was actually considered to be one of the most dangerous cities in the US. Like it's the kind of place you only go to if you have a very specific reason to do so. And more often than not, the reasons people do find themselves in East St. Louis are nefarious at best. And as if all of that isn't horrifying enough, the spot that Phoenix's car was discovered was eerily close to Interstate 70, which is sometimes referred as the sex trafficking superhighway of America. And actually the St. Louis metro region is one of the top 20 areas in the country for human trafficking. So needless to say, Goldia and Lawrence were gobsmacked to learn that Phoenix had potentially been anywhere near that area prior to her disappearance. They were also shocked to learn that despite the fact that the registration in the glove compartment of the blazer clearly showed that Golnia was the owner of the vehicle, police never contacted her to inform her that they discovered her blazer or that they'd had it impounded. And this oversight has really ruffled some feathers, not just within Phoenix's inner circle, but just within the community as a whole. A young woman is missing and police had seemingly pissed away the most important investigative time frame by refusing to do their due diligence and instead just operating under the assumption that Phoenix would just miraculously show back up. I mean, how often do we hear that the first 24 to 48 hours of an investigation are the most crucial? Possible eyewitnesses will be the most accurate during this time frame. Evidence is the least degraded it's ever gonna be. And above all else, Every minute that ticks by makes it less likely that someone's going to be found alive. So I will just never understand why police are so quick to be like, eh, let's give it a day or two, when it is statistically proven that a day or two could mean the difference between life and death. It is just so infuriating. Oh, and speaking of infuriating, when Goldie and Lawrence tried to pick up the blazer, the impound lot tried to charge them $1,000. Yeah, they actually had to contact the mayor in order to get the fee removed so that they could retrieve the car. Because why wouldn't we want to re-victimize this family who's clearly already going fucking through it just to make a quick buck? Profit over people, am I right? Absolutely ridiculous. Once they did get the car back, police finally combed through it for forensic evidence, only to find that the only DNA inside the car belonged to Phoenix and her parents. And beyond that, there was absolutely no sign of a struggle or of foul play. They did find her ID, her glasses, shoes, and half a can of soda, though. But perhaps the most puzzling thing they found in the car was a torn up handwritten note. It was dated as having been written the day Phoenix disappeared, December 18th, 2011. And it said, quote, you need to make up your mind before 2012, or else I will show you what I can do about your parents. And this was weird because while it was clearly threatening sounding, the letter was determined to have been written by Phoenix, which is super weird and super confusing. I've seen speculation that Phoenix 
purposefully left this note behind in her car for someone to find in case something ever did happen to her. But whether or not that is true, it's super vague and no one really understands exactly what it meant or who potentially may have been behind the threat. It's just become another confusing piece to a already baffling puzzle. Police did also eventually search the area where Phoenix's car had been found with cadaver dogs, but once again, this just turned out to be another dead end. They were still no closer to finding Phoenix than they'd been the day that Goldia and Lawrence reported her missing. Her car gave them very little to go on and her social media hadn't been accessed since she'd gone missing. Her cell phone activity ceased, she didn't access her bank accounts. It was truly as if she had vanished into thin air. And devastatingly for a while, Phoenix's case kind of stalled out. And actually that feels like a good place for a brief intermission. So real quick, I'm going to take my break, throw on my lashes, and I'll be right back. Don't go nowhere. Okay, so when last we left off, which was probably like five seconds ago for you guys, but was like 15 minutes ago for me, the search for Phoenix had stalled out. And from Goldia and Lawrence's perspective, no one really seemed to be taking the disappearance of their daughter seriously at all. The police had screwed it up from the get-go, and what's worse is that they could barely get media outlets to entertain a conversation with them, let alone to cover Phoenix's story. At one point, they were even told flat out that Phoenix's disappearance wasn't interesting enough for the news. And disrespectfully, fuck whoever had the audacity to say something like that to parents that were agonizing over their missing daughter. Can you imagine being on the receiving end of a comment like that? Being told that your only child disappearing into thin air, never to be heard from again, isn't interesting enough to talk about? I cannot imagine anything more soul crushing. And Goldia had her own theories as to why the news seemed less than eager to cover Phoenix's story, stating, quote, if Phoenix had looked like Natalie Holloway, we would not be having this problem. And sadly, she's probably right. Phoenix was not the first person of color to not garner the media attention she deserved, and shamefully, she wasn't the last either. It is statistically proven that young, attractive, white, middle to upper class women and girls will receive significantly more media coverage than missing women who are not white or who are of lower socioeconomic classes, which is appalling. How are we still at a point in society that a person's race, income level, education, or even their zip code, how are these things viewed as the factors that determine if someone is worthy of having their story highlighted or not? Every single person's life is valuable, and there is simply no excuse for the massive imbalance of coverage provided to Black people, Indigenous people, Latino people, and all other people of color. And if I can be transparent and vulnerable for just a second, after some reflection, I've realized that this is something that in a roundabout way, I'm guilty of here on my channel as well. It is not because I care more or less about any one particular group of people. It's just that due to the aforementioned media biases, it's typically much more realistic that you're gonna find enough information to create a full length video when a case covers a white person. And that is absolutely not okay. And I don't wanna get too far off topic, but I do wanna apologize for inadvertently perpetuating this imbalance. And having come to this realization, I promise you, I will do better. I'm also going to list some incredible resources down below that have been working tirelessly against these unfair biases, as well as some creators that do an amazing job of highlighting these cases that otherwise may have fallen through the cracks. But other than that, let me get back to Phoenix's story. Goldia and Lawrence felt like they were just slamming their heads into a wall. The police weren't helping. The media wasn't helping. So out of sheer desperation, they ultimately made the decision to hire a private investigator in hopes of seeing some sort of progress be made in Phoenix's case. But even with this hired help, they still found themselves on multiple occasions out boots to the ground searching themselves for these answers. They didn't even really know what they were looking for, but much to their surprise, the more they looked, the more they began to see that there was much more to Phoenix than either Goldia or Lawrence were aware of. They were shocked to find out that 
not only had Phoenix been dating a man named Mike for the past few years, but Mike had actually been living with her at her apartment prior to Goldia terminating the lease and Phoenix moving back home. And this really blew Goldia's hair back because she'd been to Phoenix's apartment. She'd done some light snooping and there were no signs as far as she could find that a man was living with her daughter. She looked in some of the closets. She looked in the medicine cabinet. I mean, she didn't ransack the place, but she definitely looked around and she had no idea that a man had been staying there. Now, I have seen Goldia state in some interviews that she did know that Phoenix was seeing someone, but I don't think that she was particularly jazzed about it. And given her strong and strict opinions, I don't really think that I need to stretch to make the leap to say that she would not have approved of Phoenix living with Mike prior to marriage. And that is likely why Phoenix kept this part of her life a secret. Friends of Phoenix's have claimed that she was actually in the process of ending her relationship with Mike prior to her disappearance. So whether it was the fact that they were no longer together or something else, whatever the case may be, when Lawrence and Goldia reached out to Mike to see if maybe he knew anything about her disappearance, they were met with radio silence. To clarify, I don't think that Goldia and Lawrence thought Mike was responsible for Phoenix's disappearance. They just wondered if maybe he knew someone who might know something or if maybe he'd introduced her to someone who might know something. I mean, when you've made such little progress in trying to track down your missing daughter, I'm sure it's really hard to let go of any potential lead. But According to investigators, Mike has been ruled out as a suspect in the case with almost 100% certainty. He was cooperative and well-mannered with police, and he also voluntarily took and passed a polygraph test. So back to square one again. All they had was Phoenix's car. And actually, you know what? Let's talk about the car for a minute. So initially, the Coldens were told that Phoenix's... Well, initially they weren't told anything, but once they were aware of the car and that it had been found, they were told that the car had been found abandoned, driver's side door open, keys still in the ignition, and engine still running. However, later, the officer who'd initially responded to the scene revised his account of when he'd first come upon the car, now stating that the car was not running and that the driver's side door was closed. And he's always maintained that he never contacted anyone because he assumed that the car had run out of gas. And I guess he figured that when the owner returned and it was gone, they'd piece things together themselves. I mean, the vehicle was obstructing traffic, so... I understand having it towed, but I will never understand the decision to not contact the registered owner of the vehicle, but I digress. He did, however, corroborate what the forensic examination of the car had concluded, that he too had seen nothing noteworthy in the car, nothing that indicated foul play or that a crime had even taken place. What was noteworthy, though, was the discovery that Phoenix had two cell phones. Yes, she had one on her parents' family plan that was kind of like her main cell phone, but she secretly had another one that was on her own plan in her own name. Initially, it was assumed that the second phone was used primarily to communicate with Mike without her parents seeing his number on their phone bill. But after looking into it further, investigators saw that she often used her phone that was on the Colden's family plan to call Mike. Actually, phone records revealed that the day before she disappeared, she spoke on the phone with Mike for almost two hours. One hour and 56 minutes, to be exact. However, when asked about the uh, meat and potatoes of this conversation, he told the Coldens that he couldn't remember. And while I can absolutely understand not remembering every minute detail of a two hour phone conversation, especially as someone with ADHD, bitch, my short term memory is a joke. But you mean to tell me that you can't even remember the overarching theme of this phone call? Mike, I am not buying what you're selling, my guy. He and Phoenix also spoke on the phone a couple of times the actual day that she went missing as well. And the last phone call that she ever made on her main phone was actually a short call to Mike just one hour before she disappeared. But again, Mike has been ruled out as a suspect in Phoenix's disappearance. So regardless of if you or I believe him or not, the 
police certainly do. Um, as far as the phone records or the contents of the second phone, that information has not been released yet, at least not as far as I'm aware of. My understanding is that the investigative team is keeping that information close to the vest for the time being, so as not to jeopardize the investigation. So as much as I would love to know what kind of information they found on that phone, I get why they're not publicizing it. And if keeping that information to themselves increases the odds of someday finding Phoenix, then by all means, keep it under lock and key. Another thing that eventually came to light and shocked everyone was the revelation that Phoenix, who had always been a very serious student and who'd always found school to be very fulfilling, had actually not enrolled in any classes at her university for fall semester. This fact in particular shocked Phoenix's friend, Tim. Phoenix and Tim had been friends since elementary school and he knew a lot of Phoenix's secrets. However, the fact that she'd chosen to forego continuing her education, at least at the University of Missouri at St. Louis, well, that was something that she kept even from him. Phoenix's best friend Akira, on the other hand, had a lot of interesting information to provide to investigators. Akira told investigators that things weren't all sunshine and rainbows for Phoenix at home. Rather that Goldia and Lawrence were incredibly controlling of Phoenix in every aspect of her life. And once Phoenix had been forced to move back home, things had become quite tense, which we've mostly already gathered. However, it was the insight into Phoenix's second cell phone that was really eye-opening. So evidently, according to Akira, Phoenix had that second phone so that she could secretly communicate with her second secret boyfriend, who ironically was also named Mike, so to avoid confusion, I'll call him Mike too. So Phoenix had met Mike too at the store he worked at. Things started with them just innocently flirting back and forth. Mike would sometimes give her discounts on things, but eventually things escalated until they were seeing each other outside of the store too, if you catch my drift. Now, I don't really know how long this relationship went on for. Akira wasn't really sure if Phoenix had even still been seeing Mike too in the months leading up to her disappearance, but some of what ended up coming out about Mike too didn't really give investigators or Phoenix's family the warm fuzzies. Mainly that he had a restraining order against him that had been filed by an ex-girlfriend. Allegedly, he'd been verbally, physically, and emotionally abused towards this girl. And when questioned, she told investigators that throughout late December 2011, she had noticed him on multiple occasions obsessively researching Phoenix's case. And as someone who's likely pretty high on the FBI's watch list because of my own personal Google history, I know that just because you Google something sketchy doesn't inherently mean you're sketchy. However, the more this girl confronted Mike too, the more his story changed as to why he was looking into Phoenix's case in the first place. Initially, he told her that he was just interested in the case due to the fact that he was studying psychology. Then I believe he told her that he was just curious to see if police had made any progress in her case yet, but eventually he did finally level with her and admit that Actually, he'd had an intimate relationship with Phoenix prior to her disappearance. Understandably, the girlfriend got kind of jealous. Like, why are you obsessed with this girl you used to date? To which Mike too responded, why are you worried about someone who's dead? At the time, this girl didn't really analyze too deeply what exactly Mike too meant by this comment. And even in hindsight, she isn't really sure if he was just assuming Phoenix was dead based on how long she'd been missing, or if perhaps he knew something more than he was letting on. And considering the fact that we don't know what kinds of conversations they were having prior to Phoenix's disappearance, since those phone records have never been released, well, it's really difficult to even speculate on what he may have meant. But anyways, back to Akira. According to her, Phoenix had become incredibly paranoid prior to her disappearance, which could be explained by the rumors that Phoenix had started experimenting with drugs prior to going missing. But whatever the reason, Akira claims that Phoenix was always looking over her shoulder, that she was super terrified that she was being followed by someone or that something bad was going to happen to her. And this was not the Phoenix that Akira knew. It was like she was dealing with a completely different person. And honestly, I think Phoenix may have been able to feel that Akira was starting to pull away from her because Phoenix started to lose trust in her. At one point, she actually even pulled a knife on Akira. Yeah, they were arguing about something pretty trivial 
in the grand scheme of things. Phoenix thought that Akira had been talking about her behind her back, but trivial or not, Phoenix was bothered enough by the argument to pull a knife on Akira. Eventually she did calm down and the situation de-escalated and the two of them stayed in touch right up until Phoenix disappeared. The last time they spoke was about a week or so, give or take, before Phoenix went missing. And according to Akira, during this conversation, Phoenix kept saying that she was just going to pack up all of her stuff and leave. All in all, Akira believes that Phoenix was really struggling mentally prior to her disappearance. Whether she was suffering from depression or something else, I think it's very clear that she was going through something heavy and she did not know how to cope. And if what we've discussed so far doesn't come across that way to you, perhaps this next thing will. So about a month before she disappeared, Phoenix took a video of herself. It's often referred to as the selfie video. And in this video, Phoenix is clearly very emotional. She's sitting in her car, filming herself and just pouring out what she's feeling. A stream of consciousness of sorts. I'll link down below where you can watch the video yourself, but some of the things that she talked about were wanting to start over, stating, quote, I just want to start over. I just feel like I can't start the new me over. She talked about feeling isolated and not feeling valued, stating, quote, people don't give a fuck. I don't know. I've got to see things for what they are, you know, instead of thinking about it like that see things for what they are. She then began reciting a version of the serenity prayer stating, quote, Lord, please help me accept the things that won't change and that I won't change the things I can't change. And then she just talks about being sad, stating, quote, I just wanna be happy, man. I can't remember a time when I was happy, genuinely happy. I feel so stupid because I let myself go a little bit. I probably would have been in a better situation if I would have stuck with how it used to be. She then wraps up the video by stating, quote, the only person who won't let me down is me. The video is just so sad to watch. You can just see the deep, raw emotion she's feeling. And I don't know, she just, she seems lost. Now, there are a lot of theories surrounding, I mean, the case in general, but regarding this video specifically, people have widely speculated that Phoenix is alluding to the fact that she'd gotten herself wrapped up in something. I see drugs and sex work mentioned a lot, but people speculate that she felt she'd gotten herself wrapped up into something too deep, something that her parents wouldn't approve of, and that she was struggling to figure a way back out, a way back to who she used to be. And while Goldia and Lawrence have gone on record multiple times saying that there was nothing Phoenix could have done that would have ever changed the way they looked at her, that no matter what she may have done in the past, they were just desperate to find her. They, they just want her home, which in theory is beautiful, truly. However, there is a chance that just before her disappearance, Phoenix may have lost some trust in her parents. And I say this because apparently before she went missing, Phoenix had gone into her family safe and she'd taken $2,500 worth of savings bonds that were issued to her and her mother. She took them and she cashed them. And to this day, no one knows what she did with that money or what on earth she could have possibly needed it for. But that is not the reason that Phoenix may have lost trust in her parents. No, that may have happened when, while going through the safe, looking for the savings bonds, Phoenix likely discovered that she had two birth certificates, one as Phoenix Reeves and one as Phoenix Colden. And from my understanding, this would have been the first time that she learned she was born out of wedlock and that Lawrence was not her biological father. And finding this out this way at this point in her life could have really messed with Phoenix's head. I mean, her life basically went against everything that Goldia and Lawrence had taught her about saving herself for marriage. And this combined with the money and selfie video and her telling Akira she wanted to leave and start over has led a large group of people to believe myself included, that perhaps Phoenix left on her own volition. Some people even buy into this theory to the extent that they believe that Phoenix staged her own disappearance and ran away to start over under her birth name, Phoenix Reeves. I mean, she had the documentation to do so, so 
it makes sense. However, this theory was looked into. And even though four people named Phoenix Reeves were located, investigators were able to almost immediately exclude three of them. The fourth and final one, however, seemed like it could potentially be promising. While there wasn't much information available for this Phoenix Reeves, from what they could tell, it looked like she kind of just appeared in January of 2012, which was just a few short weeks after Phoenix had last been seen in Missouri. Unfortunately, though, after visiting the listed address, which was in Anchorage, Alaska, by the way, it turned out to just be another dead end. No one at the residence recognized Phoenix's picture, nor did they recognize either of her names. And this must have been just devastating for her family. To have such a seemingly strong lead just fizzle out into nothing yet again, leaving them right back at square one. Ugh, I just can't even comprehend what an emotional roller coaster this must have been for them. But perhaps the most devastating lead or tip or whatever you want to call it, came from a man in Texas claiming to know where Phoenix was. And horrifyingly, he was claiming that she'd been forced into a local prostitution ring. So desperate to locate and save their daughter, the Coldens poured every cent they had into search efforts to follow this tip. But wouldn't you know it, it turned out to be complete and total bullshit. Just some sad, sorry excuse for a man toying with a struggling family just to get some attention. What the actual fuck is wrong with people? The Coldens struggled so hard financially after this that their house was almost foreclosed on. But you know, thank God this loser got his 15 seconds of fame, right? God, people are so heartless. Luckily, the Coldens were able to sell their home before the bank took ownership of it, and they were able to take the money and find a new place to live. And when speaking about this, Goldia, bless her heart, said she didn't care. She said they could take the house, that they could take whatever they wanted. All she cared about was figuring out where her daughter was. Now, there have been some significantly more compelling reports of sightings of Phoenix in the years following her disappearance. The first was about two and a half years after she was last seen. A family friend of the Coldens, a man named Jeff, claimed to have run into Phoenix at a grocery store in St. Louis. He said he tried to talk to her, but that she was very obviously not interested in having a conversation with him. And he did tell the Coldens about this, and ever since, he's been left believing that Phoenix left on her own and that she didn't want to be found. Then later in 2014, a friend of Phoenix's from church, a woman named Kelly, swears she saw Phoenix on a flight from Las Vegas to St. Louis. She said that the woman was with a group of other beautiful women, as well as two men whom she likened to professional football players. Kelly was so sure that it was Phoenix that she actually called out her name and the woman turned around immediately, looked at her and said, oh, do I look like someone? And Kelly's like, yeah, you look like my friend Phoenix. And then the woman just turned around and walked away. Kelly was spooked about this through the whole flight, just straight bugging. She even told the flight attendants who contacted police. But frustratingly, the woman disappeared into the crowd at the airport and they were never able to confirm her identity. And unfortunately, beyond that, there's not really been much further progress in Phoenix's case. Her disappearance continues to befuddle her family, her friends, and the investigators on her case to this day, over a decade later. Now, I did briefly touch on some of the theories that are out there surrounding what may have happened to Phoenix, but there are three specifically that you will see no matter where you look into this case. So I'm going to go over them right now. Theory number one, the sex trap theory. As we discussed, it was initially reported that Phoenix's blazer was found in the middle of the road, still running, almost as if she had been snatched from her car during her drive. And this area is known for being a human trafficking hotspot. Interstate 70 runs straight through the city and provides easy access to anyone looking to move contraband. Drugs, stolen goods, people. You hop on I-70 and suddenly you have like almost a 2,200 mile straight shot across the country. Polaris, which is an organization aimed at preventing human trafficking, estimates that the number of sex trafficking 
trafficking victims just in the US is somewhere in the hundreds of thousands, which is horrifying. And the Coldens did look into this theory, frequenting strip clubs and bars in order to speak to sex workers and bartenders and even drug dealers in hopes that someone may have some information to provide them about Phoenix. But unfortunately, all of this just led to more dead ends. And I think looking into this is how they came to learn that prior to Phoenix's disappearance, there had been at least one other girl taken right from in her car in the same area that Phoenix's blazer had been found. Apparently, this girl had been snatched right out of her car while she was stopped at a traffic light. Her car was left running, smack dab in the middle of the road, and according to this woman, she was then told that she was going to be forced into sex work. Now, this woman did manage to escape, but what happened to her definitely has some eerie similarities to Phoenix's story. And a lot of people think that Phoenix's selfie video has some earmarks of someone who's being groomed for human trafficking. Phoenix was clearly in a vulnerable state. She was clearly unhappy. So did someone promise to help her? Did someone promise her a better life, a happy life? We tend to think of these things as like, random snatch and grabs, but sometimes these people are in it for the long game. They can be terrifyingly methodical, sometimes even going so far as to purposefully set a girl up to do something she's ashamed of. That way they can then hold that thing over her head in order to manipulate and blackmail them down the line. So is that what Phoenix meant in her video when she said that she would have been better off if she'd stayed the old Phoenix? Did she do something she was ashamed of? Did she get herself wrapped up into something that she didn't feel she could get out of. Phoenix had been so sheltered all of her life. So if she felt like she was in trouble and someone offered her a way out, maybe she took it and maybe she didn't realize what she'd gotten herself into until it was too late. And then once she was gone, maybe she wasn't allowed to contact her family. And was all of this somehow connected to the threatening note that they found in her car? I don't know. It's all just, it's really strange. And it certainly seems like it could be an explanation as to what happened to Phoenix, if you believe the initial story that the car was found still running. However, if the engine had in fact been turned off and was not running when the car was discovered, well, that leads me into theory number two, the theory that Phoenix ran away. She felt smothered being back in her parents' home, back under their watch. She ran away from their rules and restrictions and the pressure of their expectations. I mean, she had the Phoenix Reeves birth certificate, so she could have easily obtained a new social security card, a driver's license, a passport. And from there, maybe she changed her name again. And maybe that's why she wasn't able to be tracked down when investigators looked into the name Phoenix Reeves. Because my thought is that if her car was turned off and there were no signs of a struggle in the vehicle, and the only DNA recovered from the vehicle was that of Phoenix, Goldia, and Lawrence, who's to say that she didn't purposefully abandon her car and hop into someone else's and disappear into a new life? I do want to clarify that Goldia and Lawrence have repeatedly refuted the theory that Phoenix ran away. Lawrence has been quoted as saying that Phoenix had everything she needed and most of the things that she wanted. So he couldn't see any reason why she would want to run away. And I know this happens, but I do have a hard time believing that even if she did want to run away, that she has not even once in almost 12 years reached out to anyone to let them know she's okay. Again, I know it's possible. If you want to disappear and start a new life as an adult, you're well within your right to do so. But how many people would truly indefinitely leave their family to wonder if they were alive or dead. I mean, there was no activity on any of her bank accounts, cell phones, or social media since she disappeared in 2011. Would someone like Phoenix, who, although incredibly intelligent, didn't really have a lot of independent life experience, would she even be able to completely go off the radar and start a new life without any help? I personally just feel like if she ran away and was living a nice, happy life somewhere, by this point, she would have at least let someone know, like, I'm good, you can stop looking for me. Which leads me into the third and final theory. And that is that Phoenix met with some sort of foul play. I mean, Lawrence and Goldia have been open in their thoughts that prior to her disappearance, Phoenix may have gotten herself wrapped in with an unsavory crowd. So did someone in that crowd cause her harm? Truly, unless she's found someday or someone comes forward with information, it's 
almost impossible to say. Personally, I think it's a combination of theory two and theory three that explains what happened to Phoenix. I think she wanted to run away and start a new life and that she didn't want anyone to come looking for her. I think that's why she left her car in East St. Louis. I think she knew that that was a dangerous area. And I think she knew that if people found her car there, they would likely assume the worst. I think she was in over her head trying to construct this whole new life though. And that maybe she met some people along the way who she thought would help her, but who ultimately ended up not having the best intentions. And I think that she met with foul play at their hands. Obviously though, that theory is rooted fully in speculation and is just my own personal opinion. In fact, I hope more than anything that she's still out there somewhere and that she's alive and well and living the life that she always wanted. That would be the best case scenario. Duh. But I just don't think that it's statistically likely. That said, Goldia and Lawrence are steadfast in their belief that Phoenix is still alive out there somewhere. In fact, I've actually seen Goldia almost refuse to do an interview because one of the people she was speaking with accidentally referred to Phoenix in the past tense. So she clearly refuses to believe anything otherwise. And you know what? I hope she's right. With that, if by some chance someone watching this video has any information regarding the disappearance of Phoenix Lucille Colden, I implore you to please reach out to either the St. Louis County Police Department at 314-615-5317. Specifically, you can reach out to Detective Moore at 314-615-5400, or you can reach out to the Federal Bureau of Investigations at 202-324-324. 3000. Quick refresher, Phoenix was last seen on December 18th, 2011. She was wearing a dark gray hoodie with gray writing, sweatpants, and black sneakers. She's approximately five foot six inches tall, and at the time of her disappearance, she weighed roughly 123 pounds. If you'd like to donate to the search efforts to find Phoenix, I will have that information listed in the description box. And you can also help support the Coldens by joining the Missing Phoenix Colden Facebook page, which I will also have linked down below. And yeah, you guys, with that, I think we are about wrapped for today. Let me know your thoughts on this case in the comments down below. As always, I thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video and to listen to this story. If you have a case or a topic you'd like to see me cover, please fill out the request submission form that's linked in the description box. And while you're down there, that is where you will also find all of the information for the products I use to make this face. If you haven't already and you'd like to, go ahead and subscribe to my channel. I put out new videos every week, and if you turn on your post notifications, you'll be sure to catch me back here in my next one. But until then, stay safe and and have a good week. Bye guys. To, ah, ah oh my God, ah, oh my God. She'd, the, uh, huh, what? <laughs> Run, how it hit it, what, but the, whoa. What, who cemented this thing shot, my God. I wasn't sure if I was gonna like this, but I actually think I'm, Kind of into it. Despite the fact that the registration. Oh my god, bitch, what? Please. What? What the fuck am I saying? Huh? Okay. Sorry. Whoa. Gee. Where's my foundation brush? That's a fun question. Oh, son of a bitch. Oh, here it is. I don't know how I have 10,000 spoolies and I can never find a single fucking one of them. Ooh, goodness gracious. What? Oh, the more. Bitch, I might do it. I might do it. I think I'm gonna do it. Am I for real? Wrap it up. You're done.